Aaron on die. camera? Aaron, if you're on camera, sit up. Yeah, you're all I'm, slouched I'm, and crap. The hairs are still in front there. Um, there. Come here. Lean Those towards me. Those two hairs, well, they're right in the yeah. middle of his face. There, yeah. Little, uh, so he's gonna need some, little uh, spittle. Little spittle. Usually does it. Got some scissors. Razor. Yeah, they're not. Uh, they're they're right. stubborn. All right. Yeah, there you go. The it's mommy version. There. The mommy version. Okay, but you're all wrinkly. You have to sit up. Sit up like normal. There you go. Anything else? No. You want to look like a slob? You want to look like a journalist? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> we should get the loafers in the shot. Okay. You want to direct the damn thing, too? Yeah, I want to do everything. I know you I'm do. Me. I'm bored. Yeah. I don't have enough to do. Okay. Okay. We have speed. Oh, wait, wait, we've got a problem. Is it logical to believe that he could have picked up unnoticed the second glove at the Bundy crime scene? It's hard, it's hard to believe based on the fact that we know there were many, many police officers there. In fact, the defense theory is there were so many police officers there, they were contaminating the scene. So it is hard to conceive of how he could have picked this glove up uh, with all these other officers around and nobody noticed. It's also hard to believe that if all the others did notice, that they would join him in a conspiracy to conceal that fact. Is it logical to believe that if, in fact, he somehow managed to pick it up and no one saw him, that he could have hidden it to take it over to uh, Rockingham? Yeah, that part's easy, actually. I mean, pants have pockets, too. They made a big deal out of the fact that he wasn't wearing his jacket at all times, but they never said he had pants without pockets. It's, a, it's an isotoner glove, I believe. They, they crumble up to something smaller than your fist. It's not like a lined ski glove. So it would be very easy if he found it to slip it in his pocket. I don't think that's the, that's the stumbling block, though, to the theory. Okay, now we're in this hypothetical. Somehow he's managed to get it to Rockingham. There are, it seems to me there are a number of problems with the theory once you get to Rockingham. Well, I don't know if there's so much. First of all, uh, let me back you up a little. How did he know he was going to go to Rockingham? Isn't the real logical question here, assuming he wanted to plant the evidence, assuming everybody went along with it, how did he know he was going to get to Rockingham to do that? He didn't know that till after Van Adder and Lang were there. So now we have to include Van Adder and Lang in the conspiracy. If he's operating on his own, how does he know he'll ever get the chance to plant the glove? Okay? If he's operating with the others, then you have to be willing to believe that this enormous number of officers wanted to frame who? Jack the Ripper? No. Beloved O.J. Simpson. That's where the logic on that end falls apart. Doesn't he also have to know that Simpson does not have an alibi. Yeah, well, I mean, not only does not have an alibi, Aaron, but he could have been dead. He's taking this glove, supposedly, hoping it has victim blood on it without being able to determine that, obviously, to plant it at O.J.'s house when he doesn't even know if O.J.'s a suspect. Remember, they've gone to great lengths to convince us all that O.J. could have been a suspect. There's an eraser-sized drop a blood on the Bronco, they go over the fence, over the wall, in case there are bodies. How do they know he isn't dead or in a door right. now? What, are you framing a dead man? I'm sorry, you need, we need to do that again, because I think where you said it could have been a suspect, you meant to say could have been a victim. Okay. Okay. Where do you want me to start? It doesn't matter. I mean, a bigger question, Aaron, is not only what if he didn't know if O.J. had an alibi or was out of town, he didn't know if O.J. Simpson was alive. He didn't know if O.J. Simpson was another victim. After all, they went to great lengths to convince us all, the police did, that when they saw that eraser-sized drop of blood on the Bronco, they feared that O.J. was a victim, or somebody at Rockingham was a potential victim of the same assailants as at Bundy. They go over the wall looking for victims. For all they knew, O.J. Simpson was deader than a doornail. So that doesn't fit into the notion that he's intent upon framing the man. Okay, but let's assume now that all of these logical problems have somehow been reconciled. How, in this theory, to me, the, sort of the grandest problem is how does O.J. Simpson's blood get on the glove? 
Well, I don't know that it is on the glove. Well, the prosecution think, asserts if, that. If they say that his blood is on the glove, um, when is the blood tested? I mean, look, if we have a conspiracy that already involves two dozen police officers to get the glove from Bundy to Rockingham, I suppose it's easy to believe that the next day when Van Adder has the vial of O.J. Simpson's blood, since he's already in on our hypothetical conspiracy, he could have added some to the blood on, that already existed on the glove just to make sure O.J.'s blood is there. I mean, that's easy. How O.J.'s, I mean, if you've got everybody involved in this conspiracy, it's easy. If you have, if the theory is firm is working alone, then the answer is it's impossible. It's impossible for him, working alone, to have put O.J. Simpson's blood on the glove. Could have put the victim's blood on the glove, I suppose, if he had found a clean glove at the scene, but that doesn't make any sense either. Is it, is it logical... To, to believe that he could have planted the glove. Well, I think just that fact, could he have planted the glove? The answer is yes. I mean, police officers can do that. It is not irrational. It happens. It's happened here in Los Angeles before. It could have happened under some scenario that we may not know all the facts of. Is it the easiest thing to believe? No. Is it something that black Angelinos could believe based on the history of the problems they've had with this police department? They're far more willing to believe it, I think, than white Angelinos are. But then they've had that experience. But is it enough for the defense to merely cast him as a racist or a rogue cop and give him and ascribe to him a motive? Or do they have to show this jury that it is plausible that he could have done this? Well, I think that the prosecution is going to go through a series of explanations similar to what you and I have just done. Is it logical? Is it rational? Let's say you got the worst cop in the world with the greatest motive in the world. Could he have logically, rationally planted a glove with all three bloods at O.J.'s house given the preceding course of events? And I think in a pure logical sense, it sounds hard to believe. Juries don't always decide things based purely on logic. From an emotional sense, they may feel this officer is really a rogue cop and a bad guy and had a motive and could have done it. And after all, they're going to be instructed not who's got the overwhelming weight of logic, but who has proven something to them beyond a reasonable doubt. And what is reasonable? Well, what is reasonable to you? What is reasonable to me? And what is reasonable to the members of the jury may be three different things. Okay. A couple of other questions now off the glove on, and just on his testimony today. The, um, the prosecution came right out of the gate basically to deal with the issues of Mark Furman, not what he did, but who he is. Why? Well, I think they're trying to do two things with the jury. Number one, they know that probably every member of this jury, before they were ever sequestered, heard the stories that Mark Furman is a racist, that Mark Furman has, is a witness with what we call baggage, bad things. So they, they want to show this jury that they're not trying to hide anything from them. This is an honest prosecution. We give you everything we've got. Yes, this is the notorious Furman. We rip the doors wide open. You know everything we know about Furman, and we're going to have him talk about it. That's to give the prosecution credibility with the jury. It's also to give Furman credibility with the jury. We're not trying to coddle this guy. We're not trying to protect this guy. We're not trying to cover up. He can say and, you know, he can address all these issues, and we do it right up front. We're not afraid of them. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to steal the defense's thunder. Obviously, the worst thing they could have done. And it's been written up a lot locally. They're obviously reading the papers and, and watching the television, the prosecution. The worst thing they could have done is said nothing about it in their case. Let the defense unveil it like some huge bomb that the prosecution was trying to hide. Their position is clear. We're not trying to hide him. He's not perfect. We know he has baggage. We'll open the suitcase ourselves. We'll air our own dirty laundry, and then you won't make such a big deal of it. So the risk really was in not doing it that way. You the had to risk. bring it out. The prosecution had to bring it out in their own case. Now, 
Whether they should have started with it right at the top is a judgment call. Technically, none of what they've done so far with him right at the top about this is relevant. His credibility hasn't been challenged in any way, shape, or form. His relevance as a witness hasn't really been established yet. We haven't heard anything about his crime scene work. So technically, under the rule book, they shouldn't have been allowed to do it quite that way. But the defense didn't object. They obviously want it out there also. So that's how it was done. So you'd rather have Marsha Clark asking questions about Kathy Bell if that's your first impression you're getting of Mark Furman on the witness stand, then F. Lee Bailey answer, asking questions. Oh, absolutely. The way it would come. First of all, uh, F. Lee Bailey wouldn't, get, wouldn't have given Furman the opportunity to say, I've never heard of that woman. I don't know her. The first I ever heard of her was after I testified at the preliminary hearing. No, no. It would have been done very differently if it's coming out on cross-examination. How would he have introduced it? Well, isn't it true that you said... Got it and he would have used the hated n-word immediately. Now, it's interesting the prosecution has decided to deal with the n-word as an allegation of, of Ms. Bell, and the way they've done that is to put in her letter. So they're showing the jury the genesis of this statement is her letter, not his conversation with her. That's a subtle point. Mm -hmm. But it's a completely different thing than if Bailey got up and said, didn't you say yeah. at the Marine recruiting station, that if you saw a white woman and a black man in a car, you'd pull them over? Didn't you say that? Of course, you didn't say black man, did you? You said the N-word. Very different. What's the most dangerous thing Mark Furman can say on the witness stand? I am not a racist. Because? Because that will open the door to every racially negative thing he's ever said. He has apparently made statements, in a lawsuit at least, to a therapist at least, that he has bad feelings towards various minority groups. The judges ruled that those broad statements of his racial attitudes are not admissible. But that just means the defense can't introduce them, all other things being equal. If he makes the claim to be better than he is, he opens the door on everything that could disprove his own statement, I am not. It's like, you know, Nixon saying, I am not a crook, and then you can prove he steals. This, it, and it's also like, as in, if O.J. Simpson were to say, I loved her, I would never hurt her. Then that would have opened the door to every time he ever did hurt her. Right. Most of that stuff's coming in anyway, but it's the same basic theory that what, what your opponent can use is limited to absolute relevance, but if you open the door by taking a broad position, it's like, <clears throat> in typical murder cases, you'll have a defendant say, I didn't have that gun, talking about the murder weapon. Why, I've, and you, as his lawyer, your heart is sinking, why, I've never had a gun. And then the previous gun possession that never could have come in is before the jury. So one of the things, presumably, they have discussed what? is... Please don't please make these broad statements. Right, just... See, he's got to be very careful, because it isn't just his saying, I am not a racist. He also can't say things like, I would never say things like that. I would never use that word. I wouldn't feel that way about such a... He's got to be very careful not to try to make himself look better than he is. He has to cop to this. No, he's not going to, apparently. But doesn't he have to cop to some of it? Well, you see, that's the funny tactical decision. The judge has told the defense, you can only use the Bell statement, okay, which has to do with uh, mised his miscegenation attitudes, okay, the, the black-white marriage attitudes. In a way, that's worse for the prosecution, because he's now going to deny that statement so that he may stand or fall on whether or not Ms. Bell is believed, mm -hmm. which is very risky. If he were my witness, you know what I'd do? I'd ask him flat out, have you had difficulty in your own mind in dealing with members of other races? Yes. Have you had some attitudes and opinions that people could feel were racist? Yes, I have. How did you feel about that? I went to a psychiatrist for help because of that. I knew it was wrong. And now I have friends who are of other races. I have tried hard. It was part of my childhood. That a jury could understand. If he copped to that, he could say, but I'm not framing O.J. Simpson because he's black. And I'd be real. O.J. Simpson is the black man that no white person was ever threatened by.
That's what I would do. But they won't do it. They won't do it because they, they, the police department has this rigid notion that they must never admit wrongdoing of any kind. And the prosecutor's office has the same notion that they must protect this police department from ever admitting they're racist. If Mark Furman admitted flat out, yes, I have had bad racial attitudes in the past, but I certainly didn't frame this guy who was a hero to me. It's over, folks. Right. They don't well, have the smarts to do it. He's, going to, he's denying the bell statement right now. Well, maybe, maybe he's denying the bell statement because the bell statement did because he didn't say that's it. That's the only one that's admissible. I don't believe it now. Well, but why would you cop to some... I mean, if if he, d in fact, didn't say it, and and, and 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 we don't know that. I mean, we know she makes this claim, and we know that there's because some the question about her credit. may believe her. And we know the guy has racial problems. Right. And you know the jury's already heard he's got racial problems. I don't think this was the way to do it. I, I would have done the braver thing if I was the prosecutor. I didn't make that statement, but yes, I've made other statements. The statements that, that the judges said they can't use, I'm willing to talk about those and statements. That's my, and that was my question. Doesn't he have to cop to something here? Not necessarily. Uh, if the prosecution does not want to shake out all the dirty laundry, the judge is not going to force them to do that. He has said they can only use the bail statement. If he denies the bail statement, gone. On cross-examination, can he be asked that question? Have you ever used racial slurs in your life? No. Judges ruled no. Not unless he says on direct, oh, I am not a racist. Then they can use it. If I were his, if I were the lawyer managing him, I'd have him go the other way. Admit that you are. Get this whole thing off the calendar. Yeah. Move it off. And move on. Because he could say, yeah, I've had bad racial attitudes. I wouldn't frame somebody for murder behind them. And moreover, I didn't know if O.J. Simpson was dead or alive or in Australia. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. We sit for a moment while they shoot their wide shots. Yeah, of course, but you see what he would do? They had thought all this through. That's what he'll do. I don't think they will. I'd be very surprised if they do. If they do something that brave and that creative. Prosecutors tend to be very tunnel visioned. We'll see. I think it's exactly the right way to do it to me. Sure. I mean, if, if it were me it. or if it were my... I'd forget about what's the admissible evidence. I'd know what that jury already knows about right. admissible and, I would try and schmissible to it. and try to diffuse it. Right. I mean, if it's almost... If they do what you think they're doing, then it, it's, it's, it is sort of, to me, classically half-assed. On the one hand, you, but you see, introduce the subject... But you know they're going to do that because Tortolo's been running all over town saying, oh, he's not a racist, right. he's never said these things. I mean, the guy is a racist. That's why he can't admit it. That's the problem. I mean, frankly, to help the case, I'd admit it even if I wasn't. If it would just diffuse the whole issue, get it out of the way, right. what's the harm? The real dedication should be to the truth-seeking process. If you really found that glove at his residence, he killed her and him. And as a cop, you should be doing everything legitimate to prove that. If it means biting the bullet, making yourself look even slightly worse than you are, do it. That's who you were in 1983. Yeah. No, I, He's I, not an old man even now. Yeah. You know, you can grow in your late twenties. Yeah, I mean, it's, it strikes me as a difficult problem, but a manageable problem if you handle it right. If you're creative enough, but prosecutors are notoriously not creative, and I'm telling you, okay, they yeah. they are terrified yeah, to have right. anybody on this police department ever admit they were a bad dude. Even after Rodney King, nobody's a racist on this department. They're horrendous. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're the children of the Yokies. Bad news. Especially, especially under Daryl Gates and the idiot who preceded him. Not the immediate idiot. Was Tom Redden, Redden was. Yeah, but, oh, Chief Parker. Right. Guess stop the training. for my time. Oof. Most non-corrupt, financially non-corrupt police department in the country, but what they lacked in graftability they made up for in Gestapo tactics. Yeah, I always said I'd rather have a cop and take a, take a bribe than beat you up. That's my basic feeling. I mean, it's... it's it's an interesting history, I think, the LAPD. I mean, the, 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 it's always struck me that there's this enormous difference in the kind of cop an L.A. cop is and the kind of cop a New York cop Absolutely is. Absolutely. Where they came breed. from. A different breed. Their, their, their connection to the community, <coughs> if any. 
It's uh, terrible. We have like a, a super professional police department, which means they're detached from the community, they're elitist towards the community, right. they're ethnically, at least for the longest time, totally different than the community. They're rigorously trained in militaristic ideas. Right. They're incorruptible. It's, I don't like people who are incorruptible. They're not human. Yeah. New York Police Department is a whole other thing. Does the LAPD solve crime better? I doubt it. I, I doubt it. I mean, it's true that you know you can't bribe them, but then, yeah, Christ, you can't get away from them if you're black. 